Saudi Arabia and Iran have announced that they are resuming diplomatic ties. The deal was struck in Beijing. The kingdom broke off ties with Iran in 2016. Imran Khan is joining me live from occupied East Jerusalem on this. Imran, we wanted your perspective, or more precisely, the Israeli perspective on this, because, of course, what happens between the two regional powerhouses, Iran and Saudi Arabia, stands to affect Israel in many different ways. That's absolutely right. Israel will be furious that this resumption of diplomatic relations is taking place and will take place in the next two months. Now, there's really one reason for this. Israel has always said that Iran needs to be completely isolated from the rest of the international community. It says that Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapons program and presents a threat not just to Israel, to the rest of the world. Now, it's worth pointing out here that Iran has always maintained that is, uh, its nuclear program is civilian and completely just for peaceful purposes. But there'll be more pressure now on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's often said that he's the only person that can really deal with Iran on the international arena, that he's a tough guy when it comes to Iran. But he's also under pressure from the Americans to expand the Abraham Accords. Those were resumptions of diplomatic mm. relations with the United Arab Emirates and with Bahrain. The Americans would like him to expand that to Saudi Arabia. This is a move likely to be seen in Israel as actually killing any uh, expansion of the Abraham Accord. Saudi Arabia uh, probably not going to come, in, or come on board with Israel in the full form that, say, the UAE or Bahrain did. He also wants relations with Qatar and with other Muslim nations, including Indonesia and with Pakistan. Those things aren't happening right now. So this will be a complete blow to the prime minister. No doubt, though, and he's in Italy right now, he may well react to this a little bit later, mm. uh, but no doubt he will offer up some tough words when he does speak about the reason uh, uh, that, that Iran should not be a member of the international community. Okay, yeah. So you answered what was going to be my second question on whether there had been any official reaction to this from, from Israel. But, um, but you mentioned that Benjamin Netanyahu has not yet spoken officially on this. Imran, thank you very much. You will keep us apprised of developments. No doubt that Israel will have some kind of reaction on this later today. Thank you. James Bayes joins us live now from the United Nations in New York. James, you're our diplomatic editor. Big picture, what's your biggest takeaway from this? Let's start there. It's absolutely fascinating, and it's fascinating for so many different reasons, so many different intertwining uh, elements to this. One of them Imran's just been talking about, which is clearly the situation um, with regard to Israel, the situation with regard to the Iran uh, nuclear deal. Um, Saudi foreign policy, though, in recent years has got a lot more complicated than it used to be. Now, probably worth me taking you back to how Saudis used to see the world. And you go back 78 years to the Second World War and a meeting with President Roosevelt on a warship with Ibn Saud, the founder of the House of Saudi Arabia. And the basic uh, foreign policy of Saudi Arabia was to be very close to the US. It would give the US energy in return for security guarantees uh, from the United States. And one difference of opinion of uh, those two close allies was the issue of Israel-Palestine and Saudi Arabia agreed to disagree, disagree remained a very strong um, supporter of the Palestinians. Well, as Imran's just been saying, in recent years uh, we've had uh, an effort, and it's been going on in the last few days even, of the US trying to uh, change the Saudi position, uh, trying to get the, um, the Saudis to join those Abraham Accords uh, that other countries like the UAE have already uh, joined. Uh, and there was talk in recent days of um, Saudi Arabia maybe asking for a civil, civil nuclear program, asking mm. for new arms sales in order to go in that direction. But it seems that even if they're still thinking about that, Saudi Arabia for now is, is going to, um, to reach out to Iran. That's going to seriously uh, anger Israel. It's very interesting given the backdrop of another huge issue, which is the war in Yemen. There's been a ceasefire in Yemen, or there was a ceasefire last year. It was never formally renewed. There's now a shaky truce. Uh, but it's nearly eight years that Saudi Arabia has been directly militarily involved in Yemen, and it blames uh, Iran for supplying the Houthi, Houthis with weapons, weapons they say that have even been used and landed on uh, Saudi territory. And there's another element 
in, in all this, which is the war in Ukraine, uh, because um, you have a situation where Saudi Arabia, yes, used to be a very close U.S. ally, but there's certainly been strains with the Biden administration. Uh, the death of Jamal Khashoggi, for example, one of the big issues uh, there. And President Biden was distancing himself from Saudi Arabia since his trip there. Perhaps there's been a little bit of a rapprochement. But in recent days, you've seen the Saudi foreign minister in Russia. And, of course, uh, Iran is supplying those drones to Russia. A very complex situation. But what it sh shows me is that Saudi Arabia is not anymore going to mm. adopt its uh, traditional foreign policy of being the US's very close ally. It's looking at all the different um, uh, aspects to this in different conflicts around the world. And right now, it's choosing uh, a rapprochement, uh, reopening of diplomatic relations with Iran as its best move uh, forward at this time. And, and at the center of this, you, you mentioned that the U.S. was not the power broker in this. What's surprising is that China was the power broker, right? That's where it's in Beijing that this deal was signed. What do you make of that? Well, it's, it's fascinating. Again, um, it's lots of countries. And we, we do see, with regard to the war, uh, 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 the war in Ukraine and Russia's invasion in Ukraine, we see votes in the General Assembly that looks like most of the, uh, of the countries of the world are on Ukraine's side and supporting the US. But when you speak to people behind the scenes here in the United Nations, it's a little bit more complicated uh, than that. And there are lots of countries that are hedging their bets a bit with their language on the war in Ukraine, but also on their views of the uh, superpower structure of the world, of the power dynamics of the world. They're looking not just to the US anymore. They're looking uh, to Russia. They're looking to China. Uh, they're looking to other powerful regional countries, Turkey, for example, and Saudi's one of them, the Gulf states. Uh, James Bays, our diplomatic editor reporting from the United Nations with the big picture view on this. We are not done talking about this. Thank you so much.